making this podcast series. I've talked to 25 all over the world. I mean, the nostalgia has been immense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm getting to the point now where I, I think I have to formulate some kind of 2021 adventure. Yeah, on the road. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to Oz. Nostalgic vagabond on the road. Hi, I'm Alan Hill, the Nostalgic Vagabond. I lived out of a backpack for many years during my 20s and some 30s. I'm less of a nomad these days. In this podcast series, I'm catching up with old friends, wonderful people I've met on the Traveller's Trek. And what better time is there to catch up, reminisce, and see how everyone is getting on in 2020? I hope you enjoy hearing about our journeys as much as we've enjoyed sharing. Can you hear those jingle bells? It must be Christmas time. No doubt, it's Christmas 2020. For many, it will be a different experience this year. Certainly, it is for me and many people I know. But all is okay. Because this episode of the Nostalgic Vagabond podcast is the extra, extra Xmas special. And as this is the special episode, it's not consistent with other episodes in the series. My mate, Matt Bennett from Northern England, is on this time. Open minded traveller, photography enthusiast, always up for a laugh and a good ale. It's been more or less the same since we met in the HI Hostel in downtown Montreal in the late spring of 2010. Matt and I have been on a bunch of adventures here in the UK and abroad over the last decade. Originally, we planned to conduct this pod face to face, but COVID measures and timing screwed us yet again. But it's all good. We have Zoom. So, how is this pod different, you're wondering? Well, instead of me hosting this one, I've asked Matt to design some questions for me so you can get to know the Nostalgic Vagabond a little bit more. Matt has a stack of questions on the evolution of the Nostalgic Vagabond and the journeys that began over a decade ago. And we'll most definitely run out of time and not get through them all, but it's all good and probably for the best that you don't know everything about me. Need to maintain some sense of mystery, eh? Also, Towards the end, I want to read a little Christmas poem that I wrote. Tis the season. Anyways, let's crack on. And in the words of Matt Burnett, special guest host, if you will, for the extra, extra Xmas special of the Nostalgic Vagabond podcast for 2020. Enjoy. Matt Burnett, thanks for coming on the Christmas special. How's it going? Yeah, no problem, Alan. Yeah, it's all good uh, for 2020, obviously. Yeah. What about yourself? Yeah, I'm pretty good. Looking forward to this. Looking forward to having a bit of a catch up over zoom ideally we could have done this face to face but uk lockdown ah uh, one man's tears <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i just thought i'd do a quick little info session on you and me we met in montreal in 2010 yeah uh hi montreal i believe yeah yeah in the hostel there in uh downtown montreal and we just hung out for three days or so with francis Gagnon and bradley cooper Awesome for some. Well, do you not remember though the uh, inaugural meeting though? You were on the bottom bunk. Yeah. We had a bunk bed. Yeah, and I remember I think you were just like led down on it and I just like slammed me a, like, I had this like ridiculously massive rucksack at the time. I think it was called a Highlander or something, about hundred litre <laughs> pathetic, you know. And I remember you just like looking up and going, uh, do you want a pizza? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we went for dominoes across the street like proper bogans, didn't we? Yeah, and you were like really angry about how much the pizza was. <laughs> Yeah, we get a two for Tuesday or something. And I was like, oh, right, compared to Britain, it's pretty cheap, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, That's where the, the friendship began. So that's more than 10 years ago now. But oh. we've been on quite a few adventures since then. And now we find ourselves about an hour away from each other on the train and only being able to converse via Zoom because of the COVID lockdown. Yeah, yeah, the, the irony of that, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about how could I make the Christmas special special? Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, it's got to be different to the normal proceedings. And obviously it's got to be slightly Christmassy. I'm going to read a poem that I wrote in a day or two, a few weeks ago, which is a Christmas poem based on the Twas the Night Before Christmas story. Right, okay. Inspired by that. But we'll say that for a little bit later. But I figured also to do something different. Mm -hmm. Why not let me, the nostalgic vagabond, Instead of being the interviewer, be the interviewee. Uh. 
And so I thought, well, who could be a nice interviewer? And I thought, yeah, Matt Burnett, he's done a radio show before. So maybe he uh, can do it. Yeah, hang on, uh, a one-off radio show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was relieved of my duties after that one show as well. <laughs> if you wanted to take the the interviewer hat on and uh, ask me any questions you like to sort of relate to travel and Christmas or whatever you like, and we could go from there. What do you think? Well, yeah, yeah, why not then? Well, I think we'll start off at the very beginning then, Alan. What made you want to travel? Good question. Hmm. I guess I was bored right. for a time in Australia. So I was trying to find more in life. When you say you were bored, I mean, you, you came from like a small small seaside town, yeah? Do you think that had anything to do with it? Do you think if maybe you'd been in the big city, things would have been different? Or Well, I was living in the big city for the first 10 years of my life. And then the second sort of eight years of my life, I was living in a small town, which was on the coast. And that was fairly homogenous. And then I went to university when I was 19, I think. And I went to the capital city, which is not a very big city. And again, it's quite homogenous in a way. Um, so I guess that didn't appeal to me. When I went on my big travels, that was when I kind of decided to leave Australia for good. And maybe that was because I felt like Australia wasn't where I wanted to be at that point, or maybe there was more to this world and more to explore. Um, so that was when I went on my big trip. Do people find it odd, though, that you wanted to leave Australia? I mean, you know, that, I can imagine that being a question asked a lot. You know, why do you want to leave there? There's opportunities there, there's work, it's nice weather. I mean, I've never been like, I can't vouch for that. But <laughs> No, you're right. I have been asked that question many times, usually being asked that question by British people. Canadian people, often by people who haven't actually been to Australia before as well. So it's not something I haven't been used to. Australia is one place. And I think now that I look back, it is a pretty nice place to be, but it isn't the only place to be. And there's elements of good in all the places you can live in. It just depends on what you want and what resonates with you. I was working in a supermarket for a bit when I finished university and I had a boss and I don't even know why, what happened, or whether it was something I said, but he called me un-Australian. I sort of thought about it for a bit, and I was like, yeah, maybe I am un-Australian. Well, you don't surf, do you? I've never surfed, no. <laughs> no, that, that, was, that was massively disappointing <laughs> to me and my, all my friends in my town. What, this Aussie who doesn't surf? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I thought about maybe I, I'm not particularly Australian, so what the hell am I doing living there? So I left. <laughs> but I suppose I didn't leave necessarily like that. I mean, I did I did take a trip in 2009 for about 6 weeks to the states, which is something I wanted to do when I was sort of 18, I suppose, but I never had the money. Actually, I didn't really have the balls. And I remember studying the USA when I was in year 6, so I was a 10-year-old doing a project on the USA and I found it really interesting and and of course you've got the you know, the Hollywood movies and all that stuff. So you are exposed to the USA always. So it was intriguing to me. And I went to California in 2009. And that six week or so trip over the summer in the Northern Hemisphere was, I mean, the point of that traveling was just to get away for a bit. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know people can get stuck in a rut, get stuck in a routine. And at that time, you sort of have to remember for context that we would, just really slowly coming out of the global financial crisis in 2009. Me as a relatively new graduate from 2007, not being able to get any work, like, well, that's a lie. I had work, but I didn't have career work, let's say. I was still working the same job that I was doing whilst I was at university. It was more full-time rather than part-time and in the evenings. And the fact that I was full-time was driving me crazy, basically. That trip in 2009 to the States was to get away for a bit. And it was really, really amazing. I don't know if I've even had an experience quite as good as that in a way since, but I think it's a timing thing. Yeah, I think as well, it's when you do your first trip, it's a massive thing. You know, you do that first trip abroad, perhaps maybe not in your own country, but if you're going to a totally different country and different people, different experiences, obviously you're on your own. That's a big deal. There's a certain freedom there. No one's watching over you. 
Yeah, that's true. I mean, I have to put it in context that this trip in 2009 to the USA, it wasn't by anywhere close to the first time I traveled, not even close to the first time I traveled on my own. But it was the first time I traveled for that many days in a row and the first time I traveled probably that far away from home. I mean, I'd been to Pakistan before, I'd been to Singapore, I'd been to New Caledonia, I'd been to the opposite side of the country, which is further than most Europeans would ever travel if they'd never left Europe, just going to the other side of Australia, Sydney to Perth. So I had been on my own and away before, but I think it was just a certain time in my life where I just really needed to escape. And I think that word escape kind of describes that trip to the USA in 2009. However, that also gave me along with the fact that I thought I was (laughs) un-Australian, the idea that the following year, my 26th birthday present to myself was a one-way ticket to LA, again, to get out of the country. But the idea was to head into Canada, get work, and then see what happened after that. And I actually met you a few months into that trip when I'd gone up from LA into into Seattle, Vancouver, and headed east. By the time I met you, I was in Montreal. When you announced, you know, to your friends and family that you were getting a one-way ticket, how did people react to that out of interest? Um, well, my my family have always been relatively, I guess, supportive, silently supportive, perhaps is the best way of putting it. I mean, there was no necessarily, uh, there was no arguments. There was no tears. I mean, I think my mum always knew since I was, in a, you know, since I was a teenager that I was probably going to leave. I think I've got sort of the black sheep type brand. I remember some work colleagues who just didn't really understand the fact that I wouldn't want to come back to Australia. Hence, you know, why don't you have a return ticket? Other people said, who are you going with? And I said, I'm going on my own. And they couldn't really understand why you'd want to travel on your own as well. But I mean, all these people weren't travelers, I would say. The people who ask those kinds of questions, I don't think maybe necessarily have experienced traveling in a way that you and I have, where we've gone on a journey, on a pilgrimage, and just gone out basically on an adventure. And we don't know what to expect, but we just embrace it. I think if you're somebody who hasn't really done that, then you don't fully understand what it's all about. Did you have more positive reactions or negative? I'd say I'd have more positive reactions, Mm. but that's probably because of the people that I surround myself with in general. Yeah, yeah. Of course, you always will get a mixture of positive and negative reactions, people tell you what they think based on their experiences. So, I mean, I knew quite a lot of international people when I was living in Canberra. So just before I left Australia, you know, they were from India, from the Philippines, from Laos, uh, Vietnam, uh, Canada. You know, I, I worked in this huge store and there was probably 30 plus nationalities who worked within that store. So I knew lots of international people. And if you're an international person, if you're an immigrant, you already have a different perspective. And I think the idea of me going abroad and experiencing other cultures, perhaps theirs included, they're very positive about that. You know, some bogan maybe who's never been 100 kilometers outside of their own city, you know, perhaps just don't get it. (laughs) Yeah, talking about that, I mean, what about how come you you didn't fancy going barley? I mean, people in Britain, you know, you go Magaluf, you go Ibiza. (laughs) I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Set package holidays, nothing wrong with that. But did did that never interest you? No, not really, because I I mean, I'd already traveled in Australia. As a kid growing up, my parents would take me on road trips with my brothers and sister up and down the coast, the east coast of Australia. I'd been on a road trip to Tasmania before with my mate. I'd been out to the west coast to see mates and to sort of have a little two-week exploratory adventure in between my university uh, semesters. Bali didn't appeal to me because it's basically the scenario is that you go to Bali and you just hang out with other Aussies. And so I figured, well, why go there? Why not just go? Well, at that time, you know, if if I live on the coast, just go down to the beach, which is free and hang out with Aussies. Why spend hundreds of dollars on a flight to Bali and hang out with Aussies? I could do it at home. Yeah, yeah. I can remember a a travel agency in my hometown once and I went in and one of the one of the bigger pros they gave of taking holiday was there'll be loads of English there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and what was your reaction? Uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
People travel for different reasons, for sure. And, you know, I have traveled with other Rosies before. I have stayed in resorts before when I was younger. It's just not what I want. And if, you know, I'm going to spend my little money on an experience, if you want to, I guess, have a vacation, then fine, have that. But that's not what I wanted. I wanted something where I might learn about other cultures. I might experience different ways of life, have some authentic cultural food that you can't get at your home. You have to really go to a local establishment, a you know, foreign place to get to get foreign food. Really, at the end of the day, I think the most important thing about traveling, at least for me, is learning about myself. And I don't think you can do that if you're in your own comfort zone. And so in order to do that, you need to go away, ideally on your own, I suppose, if you're brave enough to do that, or if that's what you think you need. Go away on your own, go somewhere different where you don't really have connection to your home, let's say, so you're not with other people from your homeland. And you just have to embrace the discomfort in a way. But at the same time, when that happens, your comfort zone increases. So you can just easily more cope with a lot of stuff that you maybe never even thought you could. The 2009 trip, we're past that now. Mm. The 2000, and this is 2010, is it? Did you start off in California again there? or? Yeah, so the, the thing about LA really more than California is you can get a really decent flight from Sydney to LAX. So that's what I did the first time I went to the USA. Was that in terms of like price or is it direct or? Direct, yep. Direct flight across the, the date line. It's pretty full on. You do feel really crap when you land because you go back in time a few hours. So you, you let's say you leave at dinner time and then you arrive on the same day just after lunch. So it's it's pretty weird. And so you have to take a few days to get used to that. But I mean, that's what I did the first time when I went to America for those six weeks or so in June, July, 2009. And then 2010 came around and I looked at getting a flight to LA or a flight to Vancouver. And Vancouver was a little bit more money. And I thought, well, I'll just go back to LA, but I won't stay in LA because I don't really like LA. I'll just stop in LA, take a night to get over the jet lag and then head up to Seattle the next day. And so that's what I did. And was there any reason for going to Seattle? Did you have contacts there or something? Or No, I just fancied it. I I heard some some stories about it. You know, you've seen, again, some TV shows and films where they use Seattle as their setting. It looked really nice. And also it was very close to Vancouver. You can take a bus straight across the border. And Canada was sort of where I was destined to go because I had a working visa for there. So it was just a matter of heading in a northerly direction. And then after that, it was just a matter of heading in an easterly direction. And and just explain that working visa to us. Mm. How did that work? For young people, Mm. usually 30 or less. For some countries, it's 35 or less. But this is always changing because, you know, diplomacy is always a fluid and a dynamic reality. Um, So I was 20, 26. And I had some friends from university who'd been to Canada. And actually friends from high school who'd been to Canada and were living there and working there. They had got this visa, this working holiday program. And it was actually really easy. If anyone wants to go live in Canada, as long as they're less than 30, and for some countries, less than 35, you just go on the internet, go onto the Canadian immigration website and see what rules apply for your for what passport you hold. I mean, literally, at least it was at, at that time. It may be slightly different now, but at least at that time, it was a matter of going on the internet, filling in a form. I think I paid 100 bucks or 150 bucks they email you a a visa receipt, basically just a PDF document. You keep that, you take that to the border. So I took that to Vancouver and then they just ask you a few questions. They print off an actual sticker, a visa sticker thing or some kind of piece of paper they staple into your passport, sign a few lines and then you've got, well, at at that point, you have two years to live and work in Canada. Some countries have 12 months, but it really depends on your country. There are some restrictions. I think you can't work as a teacher unless you've got another specific visa, I think, because, you know, that's working with kids. So they need to check you out a little bit more. And I think you can't work in the sex industry. Great. I mean, I wasn't interested in that either. So (laughs) 
So yeah, you can just get a working holiday visa and you know work in a restaurant or or work in an office or or do do whatever you want. Make Canadian cash and live in Canada and have an experience. Right. So I took it from Seattle, Vancouver. Mm. Did you do any like the winter sports or anything in Vancouver? Well, when I arrived there, it was April already. Right. So it was the end of the season. However, I do remember getting off the bus that took me in from Seattle in just to the Vancouver main bus terminal. And it was dark. And I just remember looking out the window and seeing this hill lit up, like basically a white line that was snaking up a mountain. And I was like, oh, wow, that must be the ski resort. I imagine Whistler, just not too far away. So it was still happening. Was that the time of the, like the Winter Olympics or am I well out here? Or... No, you're, you're 100% correct. So the Winter the Winter Olympics were in February, so a few months earlier. So the city still had quite a buzz left over from the, the Vancouver Winter Olympics. And it was a good thing that I was there at that time as well because the city had a huge infrastructure improval because they were expecting so many foreign visitors to come. They built all these new connections on their sky train and you know obviously prettied up the city as best they could which also means you know pushing the undesirables to a certain part of the city (laughs) away from the rest which is where i was staying by the way so right right was that in a hi or no i stayed in a place called the camby right which is a very old sort of famous tavern on the corner of camby street and east hastings uh, and East Hastings is a very interesting area because that's sort of where you might say the undesirables dwell. I've, I've been to a lot of places now and, and seen a lot of interesting characters. In those early days in Vancouver, that was probably one of the places where I've seen the most yeah. crazy people in the smallest amount of space. It's pretty mental out there. Right, right. Okay. I don't know, if I'm a, I might be wrong here, but were you doing some kind of car share or something to get across Canada? Yeah, so I didn't really have a plan. Right. Um, all I know is that I needed to get wet. Uh, I needed to go east because obviously I met you in Montreal about two months later, mm-hmm. and I was needing to go into the USA a bit after that to start up a summer job that I had already committed to. And you know, I, I used to work with these crazy Canadians when I was living in Australia. They came over for their work holiday program, and you know, they would talk about how it's quite normal to hitchhike in Canada. And I'd never done that before, and I still haven't done that, but I thought about doing it. Another thing that was quite normal in Canada was this whole ride share service, I suppose. Right, so this is, an, is this, I mean, we're going back a bit now, so is this like an app or is it just internet based? Or? This is before really apps were a thing. So this is 2010. I mean, I didn't have a smartphone till. 2016 or something like that i i tried to last as long as possible uh, we all give in it was only when the banks started requiring you to yeah, you know, yeah. have banking apps on your phone otherwise you can't bank to make me get a smartphone at that point there was this website called craigslist which i'm sure you've heard of and i'm sure a lot of people have heard of items for sale and just just listed just general listings yeah to be honest websites like gumtree and facebook markets mm-hmm. and other major you know websites have basically all copied each other but craigslist yeah it was just a listing service so people like me people on working holiday programs people with very little money could use that uh that website i mean a lot of people used it to find a place to rent like to find a room to rent but i used it for rideshare people would list for example hey i'm driving from vancouver to Kelowna on this day got three seats in the car space for bags 25 bucks meet me at this time that's actually cheaper than the bus yeah it'll be faster than the bus more direct exactly uh and you know i I, i'd done it a bunch of times and people the friendly ones could even drop you at your destination yeah yeah which might be out of their way sometimes which is really really nice but sometimes it would just be stipulated on the ad i'm driving from this point to this point that's the sort of taxi you get on. But I ended up taking a huge ride share from Calgary, basically all the way to Toronto over three days with this person that I'd never met before. Right. 
<laughs> so we so we're moving up we're in toronto now are we is this is this where we're we're at in fact it wouldn't be a nostalgic vagabond if we didn't talk about the canadiana would it <laughs> the canadiana has featured in many a podcast heavily yeah i mean i was quite unfortunate when i was in toronto i mean i stayed at the hi a nice hostel but uh very clicky <laughs> The first time I was in Canada, I wasn't very organized. Because of the time of year it was as well, it was very, very busy. And so there wasn't much availability in any hostel. I remember at that time, there was probably about four, maybe five big hostels right in the city center. And there was the Canadiana. And then there was one called the HI. Like say I was at the HI, yeah. Yeah. I never stayed there, but that was a, quite a famous one. But it was also in a part of town that was a bit too far east for me i wanted to be a little bit further west yeah and there was another one called the global village yeah let, let's hear about the global village that's what i want to hear about yeah <laughs> the global village is is the one that i was able to find a room for the night because i only booked literally the day or because you know i was on this this craigslist ride share i didn't know precisely when i would arrive in toronto or at what time or you know if i might stay somewhere in Ontario for a while. I, I didn't I didn't know. I was, you know, playing by ear. But when I was going to arrive in Toronto, I was looking at the Hostel World website it would have been. And it was it was May, so it was well into the you know, the spring heading into the summer. And Toronto gets busy, man. I mean you've been there. Yeah, yeah, it's a busy place. It, it gets busy. Yeah, I think I was the same for the HI. I think it was uh I was quite lucky to get in really. Mm. And also the price too. When when like it like with an aeroplane, when the when the season's up, the price per bed is high. And sometimes, you know, that can go up even further if they know they can milk the money out of people. For me, being on a very tight budget, I was always conscious of how much I was spending per day. Yeah, I ended up getting a, a bed in this place called the Global Village. And so I'd been driving for three days or so, doing 15 hours per day driving with this woman who I found on the rideshare called Fern, her name was. and. um I arrived in Toronto downtown at about 11 p.m., pretty knackered, and I found the Global Village, which was on the corner of uh, Spadina and King, I think it was, King West. <laughs> I went in there, and there was this massive dude with no hair, Yeah. and he just goes, G'day, mate. Oh, it's... I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Left Australia come to Canada I'd been traveling for a couple of months and then I go to Toronto and the first person I meet is this bogan Aussie and I just couldn't believe it and I was and he picked my accent straight away as well and uh, he was pretty overwhelming you know I think he was probably hamming up his Aussiness whether he wanted to be the Aussie celebrity or whether he was using it to pull birds I don't know did he have a vest on uh, I can't remember what I remember was I didn't particularly like him right all right <laughs> And uh, yeah, he just checked me in and he put me in this horrible room. The best way I could describe it was it was kind of like a brothel, really. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it wasn't, it yeah, wasn't yeah. what I expected. And uh, I remember going to have a shower. The showers were unisex, which I don't have a problem with. I'm pretty liberal about that. But when the showers are unisex and the showers actually don't have cubicles, they just have a curtain. And when those curtains have rips and holes in them. Yeah. And I was just thinking, no, oh, this is a bit strange. It was almost like was it, was it like a back at university. Yeah, I was going to say, was it like a proper party hostel though? Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. It was definitely something that I wasn't right. in the mood <laughs> yeah, for, yeah, yeah, having yeah. just driven that far. Again, and this, this, this still happens today. I think people assume it's what you want, but, you know, they, they scan you in. They obviously know where you're from because they have your passport. Yeah. And they just put me in a room full of Aussies, Aussie kids who are all 20, and I was 26. Yeah. And so it was basically a bit just like being back in first year dorms. And I just, it was horrendous. So I basically just bailed out of that without staying my whole stay. Do you know, it'd be interesting to hear of someone who has an hostel to find out, you know, did he actually do that? Did he filter through? I mean, the last few times I've been putting on, I've been putting with like 60-year-olds. <laughs> 60-year-old <laughs> Brits? Well, yeah, yeah. I think it's just the case. If you get over 35, that's it. You're in the like old age category. Just, you know. 
<laughs> no, I think they do filter you. And it's it's their property. It's up to them to do what they like. You know, I, I don't have an issue with that per se because, you know, they're trying to make everyone stay as, as safe and as peaceful and as happy as possible. I, I mean, I would prefer to be in a dorm with all in- interesting people from all over the place. Yeah, yeah. But not everybody is like me. No, you know? no. Maybe some people would prefer to be in a dorm where their countrymen are in there, yeah. or at least they speak English well. I don't know, man, but I'm I'm fairly open to being in a, in a place with more people. Well, yeah, I mean, I suppose, yeah, I suppose it is in, it is easier if if they do speak your language. You go in and it's like a brick in the ice. You know, you can feel pretty at ease then. If you go into a room, you know, and it's it's not a load of people on the laptops, <laughs> yeah, and pulling the sheet, <laughs> yeah, that that yeah, that's another another topic, really. That one. <laughs> when you go into a dorm room and uh, all the bottom bunks have tucked their sheets into the bottom of the top bunk, and all you can see is the glow of the laptop monitor behind it. Yeah, I've never I thought, I've never really done that myself. It seems a bit too much effort, really, but. <laughs> Yeah, you just see the glow of the monitor screen through the sheet. <laughs> Basically saying, I do not want to speak yeah, to you. Please, leave me alone. Yeah, please keep, yeah, yeah, leave, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not here to interact in any way whatsoever. Yeah, and again, I, I, I suppose I'd rather then be with people who are going to talk to me than people who ignore me in a dorm room. But at the end of the day, you know, it's part of the journey. It's part of the adventure. You kind of embrace it. Yeah, I think I suppose you've got to have bad to know what good is and vice versa, really. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So what's so you only did a night there, did um, you? Um I think I did one or two nights. Right. Because I mean the place was pretty disgusting as well. It wasn't very clean at all. It it was it was no. pretty it, yeah, I I guess a grungy party hostel is what they <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's what in my experience was at least. Whether it was always like that, perhaps in the, the quiet season they got on top of the, the cleaning and the just the maintenance and stuff it was very old building as well so obviously that requires a lot of care and if you don't have the time or the expertise things just start to decay and fall apart yeah is it still there no 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 it's gone oh is it oh it's gone is it right i didn't know well (laughs) i think what happened was the owner died and there was nobody to take it on and so i think it was 2013 it just Right. Totally shut right. up shop. Long ago. And the funny thing was, I was actually living in Toronto when it closed. Yeah. A lot of the people who were sort of long termers there or even working there moved into the Canadiana while I was staying right. there. <laughs> right. And the whole vibe of the Canadiana changed. Did it really? Yeah, yeah. Not not for not for that long a time because they kind of eventually assimilated into the Canadiana culture. But for a bit right. it was a bit whoa, I can tell these people are from the global spillage. <laughs> the global spillage yeah yeah because i mean because so the canadian is gone now yeah the canadian is sadly gone as well the global spillage so yeah it's gone the, well so there's not many hostels now really in toronto well there was a hostel that started up on college street maybe five years ago no actually probably more than that maybe eight years ago mm. i think it's called might just be called college backpackers <laughs> my bad the backpackers I'm referring to is actually called Planet Traveller, which is on College Street. Not to be confused with Kensington College Backpackers. At that time, amongst the travellers community, we just called it that cheap joint in Kensington Market. I believe it's made improvements since those days. At least I hope so. Yeesh. The thing is, Matt, hostels aren't the same as they used to be. They've all gone boutique. Yeah. They still have that, you know, dorm and communal type setup, but it's it's almost too clean. Complaining before that things weren't very clean, but when things are kind of too clean. Yeah. And I always find it interesting when you go into a hostel and all the beds are made and laid out for you and with the quilt folded over a certain way. I just think this is a bit too boutique. Yeah, me. I mean... Just give me my sheets well, and let me make well, my own bed. Gone are the days when someone would tell you off for uh, not making your bed correctly. <laughs> Once I had that in an hostel, you had a note left on my bed. Please make this correctly when you come back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's quite sad that Toronto it lost the global village in 2013. I think it lost the Canadiana Inn in 2016. Mm which were very close to one another, very downtown in the heart of, I think it's called the Fabric District. The HI, I'm pretty sure, is still there. There's a cute little backpackers called the Clarence Castle. It's very small. It's really, really nice, actually. I ended up staying there because I was stuck for somewhere to stay, but it is a bit more expensive. Boutique-y 
but now all hostels, I think, are kind of going in that boutique range. Do you, do you think it's because you have to compete with Airbnb? I think so. Yeah. I think Airbnb has taken a lot of the market from the hostel game, at least in perhaps in downtown places. Still, people are you know starting up hostel businesses. I mean, I have to go back to Toronto and see for myself. Yeah, yeah, it's a shame. No. Montreal, Alan. Mm. What a place. What a place. <laughs> <laughs> now you, I mean, I know we met in Montreal and I mean, we had some, you know, we had good times there. I mean, uh, yeah, interesting breakfasts. No doubt. Do you want to? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should we talk about that? I think we can talk about that. Yeah. All right. Who who recommended that, by the way? Was it? I think what happened was, Matt, did you and you and me and Francis and Brad we went out all the time. We were like an awesome yeah. foursome, I suppose. Some, I mean, we weren't even in the same dorm rooms. You and I were in the same dorm room, but the other two were, I think, in separate ones again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we met Francis at the bar, the ho- the hostel bar, and I don't even remember where. Beer we were and a Brad. dog, if I remember. Yeah, beer rightly. and a hot dog. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, that was there was. All, I remember there was all this fine cuisine, and everyone was just like, "Nah, order the beer and the hot dog. It's like five dollars <laughs> or something." <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we we hung out and we sort of decided to explore the city as as a group of four, which I I, I love doing. I, I love teaming up with people I meet spontaneously and just sort of exploring the city. I'm sure it was Brad because right. Brad Brad's Canadian. Actually, Francis is Canadian as well, but Francis is from Quebec City and Brad was from um, Vernon in uh, British Columbia. And, but they were both doing their own little tours of their own country. I mean, it's so big. You could do, yeah, spend your yeah. whole life exploring Canada. Brad was doing a, a train tour. So he was on Via Rail on some fancy Via Rail pass. And he'd met this police officer on a train. This policeman just told him about Montreal and about this place called Les Princesses, which is a, a diner, a breakfast diner. He said to Brad that the, the waitresses are nude. Anyway, he was telling us about this over a beer, I think, one of the nights we were hanging out. Yeah, I remember him showing us an advert for it or something. <laughs> and I was like, I was really like dubious of it. I thought, oh, I can't, I'm not having this. It'll just be some kind of like, you know, a brothel or something. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I didn't think it'd serve a legit breakfast. <laughs> All four of us were just curious and we figured, well, we may as well go check it out. And so there was other stuff really close by that was kind of touristy that we could check out on the same morning. Where, oh, where was the other place we went? Was it Biodome or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We checked out the, the nature in the dome. And then also some of the Olympic yeah, uh, yeah. stuff was out in that part of town as well. I remember when we arrived and it was almost like in, in some kind of dodgy teen, dirty rom-com type movie. The four of us lads stood yeah, outside yeah. this square brick warehousey looking thing with a broken sign at the front and blacked out windows with you know black garbage bags and we all four of us looked at each other and just thought this isn't even open is it this is just an absolute blag we've been had for, yeah, yeah. had for idiots here tried the door and went in at least half a dozen or so old single men reading their newspapers just looked at us and then carried on with their bacon and eggs or whatever they were eating <laughs> and we thought oh what is this and then legit a, a, a naked woman came up and said table for four <laughs> yeah it, yeah it, it was just strange i just found it really odd <laughs> yeah so we sat down and just couldn't believe it and then another naked woman came yeah. out and and took our orders and <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah i mean the four of us ordered breakfasts and just gobsmacked sat in silence and ate and then I, in a way we kind of sort of relieved to leave because it was very very odd <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was just a really dubious place i mean what, is, it, is it still there that i think it's still there i mean i've never yeah. been back i do have contacts in montreal and and they've recently said yeah. it's still there. you wonder how they got away with that i mean it was like it wasn't somewhere you went like after hours or something. It was like an all day breakfast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this was what nine a.m. in the morning. We were there as well. Yeah, there, like, there was no questions asked or anything. Like, let's walked in and ordered your pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the funny thing was that about you know five or six days later, I saw one of the waitresses in Old Montreal just walking across the street, and I was like, oh wow. Yeah, I've seen you naked before. <laughs> <laughs> that was bizarre. <laughs> I 
I mean, I mean, obviously, I was only in Montreal a couple of days. I moved on, but did you end up working there? I did end up working in Montreal, but that was um, four years later. Yeah, right. Bloody hell! You, you you lose track with time, really. You don't realize how fast things go. Because was this the same trip you did the Team America, Team America, Camp America? Yeah. So when I met you, I was you know on my one way ticketing round the world trip that I didn't really know where I was going or or which places I'd hit except for the fact that I needed to be working as a camp counselor in Pennsylvania for 10 weeks during the summer of 2010 so and how did you ho- how did you hook that up oh they have agencies all over the world they have right, agencies right. and I remember I think I saw an ad in the newspaper I figured it would be a way to make a bit of money you don't really make much money though <laughs> No, <laughs> no. How does it work? Is it just kind of like, oh, you get your accommodation and a bit of spends, and yeah, I mean, you you work pretty hard though. You don't really get any days off, right? So, if anyone ever watches films like My Wet Hot American Summer, which is actually filmed at the camp I worked at, ironically, right? Or there's a a thing on Amazon at the moment called Beaver Falls, which is about three Brits going to work in a California based <laughs> <laughs> um summer camp. And these T V shows and, and films are pretty spot on to how it is. Right. Yeah. The people who wrote them have obviously been to them before. I mean, everything that happened in them, although it's fiction, I could probably rattle some names off the hats of people who have been up to that kind of mischief. <laughs> <laughs> right. I want to top my brew up, Al. So, Alan, this is a Christmas special. So tell me, have you been on the road any time at Christmas? Well, definitely, mate. I mean, the funny thing about Christmas for me is ever since I started working and, you know, you move into adulthood, I've had jobs in hospitality and in retail. Yeah. And so basically to me, Christmas means work. You know, <laughs> hey, all right, and well. and that's the same thing for a lot of people. Who, you know, who work in travel. Maybe they work on an airline. Maybe they work in a hotel. Yeah, yeah. It, it's only the nine to fivers who really get to experience holidays anyway, because their work, their place of work, is closed down. Whereas other places, they work yeah. seven days a week. You know, all year round. So, have you stayed in a hostel though over Christmas, like Christmas Day specifically? Yes, I have actually. I, in two thousand and eleven, I was in, of course, the Canadiana. Yeah. <laughs> Why wouldn't you be? Yeah. <laughs> the Canadiana, as most of the people I've had on the podcast will say, including myself, it's a very homey, very welcoming, very cozy hostel. It was run by this English guy, actually, and, and he was always concerned that everybody was having the best time they could possibly have whilst in Canada and at his hostel in particular. Festivals and holidays and things like this, he would always encourage Specifically at Christmas time, he would arrange for a small fee. I think it was about 17 bucks. You could participate in a Christmas dinner. All right. In that particular hostel, it was quite well uh, sort of set up to do something like this because they had very, very long, narrow dining tables, almost like you might get in a medieval style setting. (laughs) Right. As it turned out, in 2011, I was there. And I paid my $17 or whatever it was. And so did probably 30 other people who were staying at the hostel at the same time. Right. And this woman called Teresa, she was a, I think she was a Portuguese lady who was full-time working at the hostel, sort of in cleaning and maintenance and stuff like that. She also liked to cook. So she would work all through the night on Christmas Eve into Christmas Day to prepare enough food, turkey, vegetables, potato, mashed potato, you know, the the typical sort of Canadian fare that you might get on a Christmas day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that we could enjoy a communal Christmas together. Yeah, so I remember just hanging out with my mates, some who I still talk to to this day. And actually, now that I think of it, I think the person, Adam Sherry, who was on the podcast on November 30, was there that Christmas. And another guy called Felix, who was on the podcast in December, he was there as well, and I'll have to find a photo and post that on my Instagram, December 25th in 2011. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah, did you have crackers or anything, just out of interest? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I mean, does it, I mean, I've, just, I've never really thought about this. I mean, does a hostel, is it, 
are they open 365 days a year? Or? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, why not? Yeah, just people travel all the time. They pour on and never get in a day off. <laughs> well, that's what you sign up to, you know, and the yeah. owner doesn't necessarily have to be the manager. And you can have a manager who runs it and then a, a second manager who runs it when the first manager's on a day off. So, you know, these are businesses and businesses, some of them operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 a year, you know? Yeah, yeah. Another thing I want to talk to you about, Alan, is about health on the road. Right. Now, what I mean here is... Sexual health. Perhaps, yeah. But, I mean, with you, I mean, I don't... There's not much of that, so... Uh, <laughs> I think with you, the problem the problem is with your, your back and keeping yourself in order, because, I mean, you know, you suffer from some mm. chronic back, back pain. And When I was at university, I was always diligent with doing stretching and doing yoga-type stuff. And I remember when I was in California in 2009... The first time I'd been in a hostel for years and years doing long-term travel with just a backpack. I remember going down to the garden in the hostel and looking for somewhere to do my stretches and people were just out there drinking and stuff. And I felt like such a knob. We were a knob. (laughs) (laughs) Going around (laughs) looking for somewhere to do, you know. And so I kind of just gave up on it. Because I remember when I met you, you had, you had these routines, <laughs> like, you know, so you don't do this stuff anymore. No, I still do, you know, as much as I feel necessary. Uh, I have, you know, rollers and yoga mats and stuff. I, 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 you know, I'm a bit more flexible with how often I can do that, you know, and it's a bit, now I feel like a bit of a dick if I just go into the middle <laughs> of a common room and start yeah. doing stretches. <laughs> Ass in the yeah. air, downward dog, and people are just there having a beer or whatever. Like in this hostel garden, though, you like you everyone's having a good time, and you like breaking out some serious yoga. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man, no, yeah. no, there's none of that. But you know, I mean, I've had some injuries when I've met you. Yeah, when I came to see you in the UK, I had some some pretty serious injuries on my ankle. Oh, your ankle, yeah, I forgot about. Well, that that was from the uh, Camp America, wasn't it? That, that all was, started yeah. there, yeah. Yeah, I fell, I fell, and really ripped my ankle open. My, my tendons all snapped, so I was pretty unstable on my feet for many, many months. I mean, it's pretty good now, but it's been through diligence that it's got strong again. People get hurt when they go traveling. I mean, do you remember me doing my back in by just like bending down to tie my shoelace? <laughs> That's just pathetic, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, was it played a game of mini golf or something? I felt like, yeah, bent down, tied my shoelace. The next thing, like, ping. And I was on the floor, like, in agony. <laughs> yeah, yeah th- I think, Matt, that might have been the trip we did when we, we drove around to seven towns in seven days. Oh, yeah, and yeah. It was towards the end of that trip. And the funny thing is, Matt, when I've had my worst back pain, historically it's been after a long-haul flight, right, which yeah. is basically the same thing as driving a lot because you sat down. And that, I mean, the car as well, the the French, it wasn't the most comfortable of cars for doing that. No. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think we drove down. Peugeot was... Yeah, I think, we, did we drive down? Where did we go first? Did we go, it was Oxford or something. Oxford, yeah. yeah. I remember just getting out of the car and, oh, my back, you know, was like cramped <laughs> over. It was, yeah. <sighs> yeah, the thing is, um, you know, if if you're aware of your body and, and how you can neglect it or mistreat it and then try to minimize that i mean obviously when you sat down for a long time your back especially your lower back it doesn't get any blood flow so it it gets you know vulnerable and that's when you can do injury so you know and you experience that by bending down to tie your shoes up and you just pulled your back and i remember you laying down on a hill (laughs) and i'm just laughing at you because you know you give me loads of grief for talking about my back and then you're just there you know almost crippled because you can't oh it's dying yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but you know you have to be careful and at the same time though you, you know you need to enjoy yourself but i think if you're aware of you know your limitations and also what can damage yourself and things that you might be able to do to limit the injuries then you know that's all you can do but you know i've had i've had some issues people i know have had much much worse issues but you know i just try to be careful and not get hurt because that really puts a spanner in the works to your plans really yeah no do you remember when you came to the uk mm. right the first time and you remember i remember getting like a message off you out of the blue i think it was on facebook or something like that was Would it be, yeah. and it was saying like look i'm in trouble like someone's let me down and all this 
Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I, I just wonder going back to that back then. What would have happened if no one had ever got back to you? So basically what happened was I worked this uh, summer camp in the States in 2010 and I met loads of people, loads of English people. And yeah. because I met loads of really nice English people, it gave me the idea that, hey, maybe I should go and live in England for a while because I already am British. I have the passport. Right. Even though- so so this wasn't your original plan then? When- Not at all. Ah, right. Oh, I never knew that. Right. No, no. So my original plan was, you know, I met you in Canada. I went down into the States and then yeah. I thought I'd go back to Canada and just carry on where I left off. But because yeah. when I was working in the States, I met loads of really cool English people, British people, nice people. And I figured, yeah, I could go and check out the UK for a bit. So I'd already committed to see my brothers in the USA in August, September. And so I quickly looked on the flights and I saw a really, really cheap flight from Boston to London on September 11 because it was September 11. Yeah. So it was super cheap. I got in touch with this woman who I knew from working at the camp and I said, hey, I'm coming to London and uh, I knew she was nearby and I, I thought, yeah, I'll go and stay with her and then after that, I'd be on my way, you know, because it's, it's always nice when you have a local contact. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so I got into Heathrow in the evening, probably 8 p.m. or whatever, sent a message and um, no reply. Right. And I thought, huh, okay. And, I, you know, I kept trying. And eventually at around 10.30, I got this message saying, oh, I can't come. My grandma's ill. I've gone to hospital. So basically I'm not coming. So I didn't really know what to do. And I didn't really have any money. I was pretty, pretty, getting pretty close to having not much money left at that point, or at least in my own head, I was starting to stress out a bit. I ended up just spending the night at Heathrow Airport and then taking the first train up north to Preston because not the first train, the first bus it was actually, because the trains were ridiculous expensive. It was a mega bus. Yeah, 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 I think it cost me about 17 quid. And the train uh, was, was about bit, 140 quid. So meg- 17 pounds for a mega bus. That's pushing it a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Last minute, man. So, yeah, I ended up... Well, just to say mega bus, I mean, there might be people listening, no idea of that, me- what mega bus is. So it's well, it, like a yeah, it's, it's like a, a very low, very low. I mean, is it, I don't know if it's still going now, but it was like a very low cost travel at the time. Yeah. And they used to advertise on the back of buses, didn't they? Go to London for a pound, <laughs> but but the journeys were like awful, mm. like majorly cramped buses, no aircon or anything. <laughs> Just like took you about, you know, you there'd be like hundreds of stops if I remember all these like way out places. Yeah, it just depends. I mean, I haven't taken mega bus for a long time. No. It served its purpose then, and it was ideal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have used it. There's no, I mean, mega train was good mm-hmm. as well. Use that as well if you yeah, remember mega train. Yeah, so the th- the thing was, because the only other contact I had in my phone at that time was this bloke who was in Preston. So I basically took the first bus the next morning from London to Preston and started my my Lancastrian adventures. Odyssey, yeah. And And you were in the next town to Preston after that, so that's why I looked you up on Facebook and said, what's up? Yeah. Because I think that I don't. That's probably the first time I heard from you, actually. Since Montreal, was it? Since since Montreal, yeah. Would have been a few months later for sure. Yeah, yeah. Because did you realise that it, the town was so close to Preston? Did you figure that out, or was it just? Um. Well, I looked at a map. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you could do. It doesn't take a lot of detective work, does it? Really, I mean, I knew one? you were near Manchester. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, that was one of our early conversations we had it, eating our Domino's pizza. I remember telling you that I could tell you were northern. Yeah, cause, yeah. Because you weren't southern, but no. I couldn't tell you any more from that. And you said you're kind of near Manchester, but you're not really near Manchester. But yeah, then when yeah. I looked at a map, yeah, you were kind of near Manchester. Yeah, because I remember getting the message through and I was like, oh, I need to stay. And I thought, oh, what's this all about? Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, go on then, you know. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, yeah, you came. How, how long did you come for? Just, was it just two nights or something, if I remember right? Was it? Yeah, I just remember coming up and crashing at yours for a couple of days, which I was, of course, very appreciative of. And then, yeah. um... <laughs> then we had that night out, didn't we? In Preston, if I remember rightly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> had a few nights out in Preston. Yeah, yeah, went to a nightclub. <laughs> but you real—I I tried warning you. I did try warning you. I could say. Yeah, it's it's a 
well, even at a, a, a 26, 27 years of old, you realize you're a granddad when you go to some clubs in Preston. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think I was about 28 at the time. The oldest by a mile in there. 10 years. Uh, so how long have you been in the UK for now, Alan? Well, on and off since 2010, but it's probably probably around seven years, maybe more. Something like that. Probably too long, really, if I'm honest. Really? Yeah. <laughs> what? Are, yeah, yeah be, yeah, be straight up about the place. What? What's your um, best things about Britain? Beer is cheap. Yeah, true. It's pretty well connected. Mm -hmm. If you're organized, you can get around very cheaply and efficiently. If you're not organized, it's extremely expensive. So my advice, be organized. Yeah. Yeah, I I think the sense of humor in certain parts of the country I really like. There's something to be said. I mean, even people from the continent appreciate there is a British style sense of humor. And that's definitely true. And I think that's why there's so many really, really great British comedians because it's just it's probably something to do with the history of the place, the lifestyle, the weather, yeah, the yeah. type of climate that people live in in Britain that if they wouldn't have a sense of humor, they'd probably want to kill themselves. Yeah, no, that, well that brings me on to what do you not like about Britain? I mean, the weather <laughs> Yeah, it's just shocking. It's just bad. You know what, Matt? When I was leaving the US in 2010 and mm. I was coming to Britain. I mean, my father was born in Bath in in Bath, yeah. In in sorry, Matt. In in Britain, yeah, Bath, yeah. <laughs> and so he's always. I mean, he still is obsessed with the weather. And I remember growing up, he would always be moaning about rain and stuff. And in Australia, it never really rains. And so, why should you moan about it? But he always did. And I think that's probably part of his Britishness coming through. Yeah. But I remember when I was arriving in the UK, I said to myself, "I'm not going to allow the weather, the rain." to affect my mood and i've been pretty good at dealing with that that the one thing that i really don't particularly like about britain is how dark it gets in the winter time i really don't like that yeah yeah really don't like that yeah i mean i'm looking outside now actually i mean and we're at what quarter past three Mm. and yeah well i mean it's raining (laughs) what a a surprise (laughs) it's gloomy and it's damp yeah (laughs) great yeah yeah One of the reasons why, Matt, I wanted to make this Christmas special edition of the podcast is because I'm very much aware of how difficult it can be in the wintertime in Britain, and especially this winter and this particular Christmas with the whole COVID thing, Uh, you know? Yeah, no doubt. You'll be listening to this now thinking, I mean, probably depending on where you live in Britain, but you won't have been having Christmas dues, you may not have been able to meet family Mm. or whatever, you know, and let's say... And add that to the British weather, and what a what a concoction that is. Mm. Twenty twenty Christmas is definitely a tough one, and I think it will be for a lot of people. And I'm well aware of that. And I think just be grateful for things like Zoom, where if you can't actually meet your mates or meet your family, you're gonna have to embrace the technology and do what you can. I mean, do you think um, after this COVID, things will change? I like you say, a good thing about Britain is is that you can, you know, get these easy jet flights or whatever, you know, these cheap flights get into Europe. Do you think that'll all change or I think at the end of the day, there's a podcast I did with this guy called Mark Bratt, who has his own independent travel company based out of Manchester and mm-hmm. he remains very optimistic about, you know, travelling will always exist and it will always be and it is an industry, so it will find a way to survive. Yeah, yeah. Um how long that takes to manifest itself whether there will be some kind of new normality, it's impossible to say. It's an economy. It's a cap- it's a capitalist system. Yeah, yeah. People want to travel. People will pay to travel. Travel will happen. It might become more expensive. That's something to consider. Yeah, myself, I can see that happening. To be honest, yeah. Mm. But it, but then again, I suppose it's all relative. I mean, you make what make one thing expensive, something else comes onto the market. Another thing, Alan, you've always suggested you wanted to go South America as well. That's a- Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was something that I was considering doing in 2015, but I got really sidetracked with my writing assignments and my, my writing ambitions. So I decided to stay in the UK, and I've, I still have been here, but I've been busy writing various stories over that time. You know, when things like COVID happens, it just gives you not necessarily a kick in the ass, but it just sort of puts things into perspective sometimes about how long can you put something off for? And if you keep doing it, will it 
never happen and is that something you want you know do you want to be a 75 85 year old bloke yeah. who's not really fit to travel anymore and you regret not ever tackling that adventure that you were thinking about in your 20s and 30s i totally agree i think there'll be a lot of people who are thinking that way now of thinking once these well i mean we're on about the will there be traveling i suppose once these restrictions are lifted i think it'll go mental mm. Very possible. You know, everyone wants a bit. I mean, luckily we had the bit of sun in March, but you know, people want their holidays again, don't they? And you know, people want to travel. There's a whole generation, you know, who've probably been sidelined this year. Mm. You know, I'm talking about like people who, like you know, maybe they were leaving university, college, or whatever. They wanted to go abroad, you know, sort of like a rite of passage, really. And that's all been stopped from. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm totally all for traveling as part of growing up and discovering who you are. You know, so someone who's going from high school to university or from university into career life, etc., or even anybody in their 20s, but you know, anybody really, midlife crisis or whatever. I mean, travel can serve as a stepping stone or a rite of passage from moving from the old you to the new you. Obviously, if you've been ready for that, it hasn't really been possible. So you've had to be patient and wait. But 2021, maybe it's your time. You take the advantage of you know the restrictions easing and having your chance to be a nostalgic vagabond <laughs> <laughs> yeah i like that a good tie in there i like that <laughs> alan i'm just a bit conscious here of the time one thing i'd like to do matt if i if i may is i i'd like to read a christmas poem yeah uh inspired by was the night before Christmas, which I'm sure many listeners have heard of before. Yeah, so I, I wrote uh, it's about 500 words. It's not very long. The story is called Reindeer Vision. Reindeer Vision by Alan B. Hill. It was one Christmas past on a cold and dark night. Santa was preparing for the long Christmas flight. Sleigh bolts were tightened with graft and a groan. Then through the ice tunnel, reindeer echoes did moan. Santa jumped to his feet, shut tool case with a clatter. He rushed through the tunnel to see what's the matter. His reindeer slumped down, their spirits without glee. Eight faced the wall. All eight couldn't see. Now Santa was confused with a face full of frown. He checked their carrot box. The carrots were brown. And just in case this point remains to be seen, it's orange carrots, not brown, which contain carotene. Meanwhile, in the greenhouse, some things went awry. Corvid, the evil crow, was destroying the supply. Santa bounded inside and cursed. What the heck? Corvid killed the carrots with his poisonous peck. Corvid fled through a gap, the first he could find. Santa cried how to fly with his reindeer now blind. He prodded his forehead, so desperate to think. Who it was last time saved them from the brink? Light bulb inspiration, he grabbed a torch to go out into the blackness to trudge through the snow. Step, sink, stomp, sink, to walk such hard work. Then Corvid swooped down, and Santa went berserk. As Matador he fought, his red hat teased the crow. But Corvid was unaware how Santa could throw. A snowball he hurled clocked crow in the chest. Corvid descended below fresh powder to rest. Santa now freed, he continued his plight. His torch then failed, no more gift of light. Trapped in the darkness, he felt far from fine. What in the distance? A glowing pine tree light? Rudolph's log cabin! Santa yelled, hip hooray! A spring in his step, he pushed on, seize the day. Santa asked Rudolph, like before, be their guide. But Rudolph explained, he's too old and retired. Take these carotene tabs for magic night vision. Santa took one and then saved his provision. Santa too received a gift-wrapped ice pick. Bemused, he thought, was this taking the mick? Out into the night, Santa rushed back to base. Step sink, stomp sink. He couldn't feel his face. Then one sink too far, he fell through a mass. Ice pick did save him. He dropped tabs in crevasse. Christmas is ruined! He moaned to the missus. She knew tea and cakes were better than kisses. With one bite he knew there was no mistake. 
What he was eating was indeed carrot cake. Now feeling upbeat, Santa fed the reindeer. They could see once again with nothing to fear. Though Santa he knew cake will not sustain. He patted and prodded his elderly brain. Then gracious Mrs. Claus, always with foresight, said rely on the children to get through tonight. Every child listening, Christmas is a breeze. If you leave out some carrots for the reindeer, please. Bravo. Merry Christmas, everyone. (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, Matt, uh, we're out of time. Yeah, we're out of time. Yeah, so. (laughs) Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for taking interviewer duties away from me for this Christmas special. Yeah, no problem. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas. And a happy new year. Happy new year. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Nostalgic Vagabond Extra Extra Xmas Special. My guest and special guest host has been Matt Burnett. We're wishing you a happy and safe Christmas 2020. There are more episodes in this 2020 podcast series, and you can grab them on all podcast platforms. Any updates? Just follow me at the Nostalgic V. And don't forget, your journey is special. Oh, it. I've been Alan Hill. Until next time. Yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at the time and I'm thinking, I have to get an Ep 2 in at this rate. You know what I mean? It might have to be an, it might have to be an extended one at some point, and you know, yeah.